All right, well, good morning. Welcome to Community Baptist Church this morning, and a very uh, happy Reformation Day to you all today. Uh, we might not, we, today is commonly known as the day that is Halloween, but it's also a very important thing for, important day for us uh, Protestants. Um, I know we celebrate it in our house. Um, maybe that shows how much of a church history geek I am. Uh, but uh, today is Reformation Day, where 504 years ago, Martin Luther uh, nailed his 95 theses to a door, a uh, cathedral door at Wittenberg, and that kicked off the Protestant Reformation on October. October 31st, 1517. So I uh, just want just a little bit of church history there for us, uh, just to be reminded of that um, and how things have gone from there. And, and the Reformation was truly about getting back to the Word of God about getting back to what scripture is saying. And Martin Luther championed this. He's been quoted as saying, I did nothing, the Word did everything. And uh, I truly believe that that is um, our aim in, sh- in ministry, that the word of God does its work. And so uh, we're going to begin this morning by looking to the word of God, uh, that word of God that Martin Luther so boldly proclaimed and called uh, the church back to. And I, I want to begin this morning with reading from Psalm 99, verses 1 to 5, as we consider the holiness of our God. So I'm going to ask you to stand if you're able to, and uh, we will hear the reading of God's word, we will pray, and then we'll begin with singing this morning. This is God's word for us. Psalm 99, verses 1 to 5. The king is holy. The Lord reigns. The peoples tremble. He is enthroned between the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted above all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awe-inspiring name. He is holy. The mighty king loves justice. You have established fairness. You have administered justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Bow in worship at his footstool. He is holy. This is the God we've come to worship. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Our Father, you are holy. You are distinct, set apart, different, You are the perfection of all your being and all your attributes. And Lord, we thank you for this great and holy God we've come to worship. We thank you for the grace that has been given to us in Jesus Christ that we might approach the throne of grace. Not because of who we are in and of ourselves, but because of who you are and because of Christ Jesus who has paid the penalty for our sin and our guilt and our shame, that we might stand boldly in your presence. And so, Lord, we we glorify you. We worship you because you are our king. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let us uh, begin with singing hymn number 10 in your hymnals, and it will be on the screen behind me. Let's sing, O worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing his power and his love. Let's sing together. O worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing his power and his love our shield and defender the ancient of days pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise oh tell of his might oh sing of his grace whose robe is the light Whose cannot be space, whose chariots of wrath, the deep thunder clouds form, and dark is his path on the wings of the storm. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air. It shines in the light, it streams to the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. 
frail children of dust and feeble as frail in thee do we trust nor find thee to fail thy mercies how tender how firm to the end our maker defender friend. Amen. We worship the King this morning. Let's continue with singing hymn number 210, Jesus Paid It All. Jesus Paid It All. I hear the Savior say, thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Cause Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find Thy power and Thine alone Can change the leper spots And melt the heart of stone Cause Jesus paid it all All to Him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain He washed it white as snow and when before the throne I stand in him complete Jesus died my soul to save my lips shall still repeat cause Jesus paid it all all to him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Amen, amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated this morning. Thank you for your singing. And we want to welcome you this morning to Community Baptist Church. So great to have you with us, especially if it's your first time gathering with us. And if you're joining us online, uh, we're hoping and praying that things are working well with our live stream uh, so that uh, you can worship alongside of us. Um, Well, again, we want to thank you for joining us. And we just want to remind you of uh, the mask protocol that is um, in effect and in this building. If you are uh, heading to the washroom or if you're standing at all, you must have your mask on. You can leave your mask off um, uh, if you're standing to sing um, and while you're seated, um, but just a reminder uh, that uh, we would ask that you keep your masks on following the service. I just want to keep that in mind as well. Uh, We want to encourage you to join us for our coffee and tea fellowship following the uh, morning service, Um, so please join us uh, for that just after the service today. Also, we have our Bible study that happens on Wednesday. Wednesdays at 6.30. Um, We want to encourage you to join us as we walk through the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5 to 7. Also, uh, we have, it's that time of year where we're beginning to collect shoeboxes for Operation Christmas Child. So we want to encourage you to take a shoebox, fill it uh, for a boy and girl or girl. um, And if you want to fill multiple boxes, that's great too. Um, And have them back here uh, by the first Sunday or second Sunday in November, please. Uh, We would encourage you to do that. Um, If you can uh, have that and we'll make sure that it gets to the appropriate places. Um, um, Just a couple of announcements we want to make you aware of. quickly um, is that um, we are encouraging, we're going to be going to, we want to encourage you to give with your tithes and offerings. Uh, one of the things uh, we'd like to encourage you to give to is is to give to the Benevolent Fund. This is an opportunity we have as a church to be able to give to those who are in need. And uh, so we want to encourage you to give over and above your regular tithe and offering to uh, the Benevolent Fund at this time of year, uh, just to be a, a people who are giving. So we want to encourage you uh, 
with that um, this morning. There's many ways you can give. You can give through uh, the uh, plates are at the back on your way out, uh, the offering plates that you may give that way. You can also give on our website at mychurchfamily.ca. You can give uh, through regular posts and you can also give through e-transfer. So uh, you can take note of all of those ways in which you can, you can give of your tithes and offerings this morning. We're going to just continue our time in worship together um, by uh, hearing from God's word again. And uh, I'm just going to, and then we'll sing a song together. We'll sing, In Tenderness He Sought Me. This morning we are continuing our study through the book of uh, Joshua. And uh, we are going to be looking at God's holiness and our sinfulness as we look at Joshua chapter 7. And so I'm going to read for us 1 Corinthians 6, uh, verses 7 uh, to, or rather, sorry, verses 9 to 11, um, to remind us that before a holy God, as we've just read uh, earlier in the service, we are sinful human beings. We are broken by our sin. And we're, we are worthy of judgment, and we are worthy of punishment because of our sin. So here are the words that Paul writes in 1 Corinthians verses, chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. Paul writes, Don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit God's kingdom? Do not be deceived. No sexually immoral people, idolaters, adulterers, or males who have sex with males, no thieves, greedy people, drunkards, verbally abusive people, or swindlers will inherit God's kingdom. And some of you used to be like this, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. In spite of those indictments that are brought against we who sin, there's grace for us in Jesus Christ. His power at work in us is able to wash us, sanctify us, justify us in the name of the Lord Jesus. And that's our hope today. Friends, we're gonna sing together an an old hymn that uh, has been rewritten uh, called In Tenderness He Sought Me, Weary and Sick with Sin, and On His Shoulders Brought Me back to his fold again. You can remain seated as we sing this song together. In tenderness he sought me Weary and sick with sin And on his shoulders brought me Back to his fold again While angels in his presence sang Until the courts of heaven rang Oh, the love that sought me Oh, the blood that me, oh, the grace that brought me to the fold of God, grace that brought me to the fold of God, he died for me while I was sinning, needy and poor and blind. He whispered to assure me, I found thee, thou art mine. I've never heard a sweeter voice, it made my aching heart rejoice. The love that sought me, oh, the blood that bought me, oh, the grace that brought me to the fold of God, grace that brought me to the fold of God.
Upon his grace I'll daily ponder and sing anew his praise. With all adoring wonder, his blessings I retrace. It seems as if eternal days are far too short to sing His praise. Oh, the love that sought me. Oh, the blood that bought me. Oh, the grace that brought me to the fold of God. The grace that brought me to the fold of God. Amen. Let's pray this morning. Our God, you tenderly sought us, weary and sick with sin, and on your shoulders brought us back to your fold again. We, your sheep, O Lord, in our sin have gone astray and we've all been turned to our own way and you've laid on him the iniquity of us all. Thank you, God, for the gift that we have in Jesus Christ. Thank you for for dying on the cross for us. Thank you for saving us from our sin. O Lord, I pray that we we would be reminded of how great is this grace that has been given to us. How great is your holiness, how great is the sin that has corrupted our very hearts and lives, and yet by your goodness and your mercy, you have brought us back into right relationship with you through Jesus Christ. Bless us now, God, as we continue to hear from your word in Jesus' name, amen. Well, at this time, I'm going to invite our children to come forward and they are going to hear uh, a children's story from a very special guest this morning. So we want to encourage the children to come on forward and just stand up here while, or you can sit on the floor if you'd like. Yeah, you can sit on the floor while we hear from... So we want to cut a hole in the top, and then what we do is we lift that off and set it aside. And then what do we have to do when we get to the inside of the pumpkin? Yeah, the seeds and the gross stuff out of the inside. So I've already done that for us already this morning. So my great niece, Raya, and I helped me do our, our pumpkin. So we did it last night. So here we have some of our slimy, ooky stuff from the inside and the seeds. And there's not many seeds in there actually because I took my pumpkin seeds and roasted them in the oven. Have you guys done that before? Yeah, they're yummy, aren't they? Yeah. So then the next step after we clean out all the yucky stuff from the inside, what's the next thing we have to do? Oh, yes, 
you kind of sketched on it first to see what you're going to draw. Yeah, so then you figure out what you want to put on the front. <laughs> Did you? Oh, my nose doesn't want to stay on. <laughs> we'll set it over to the side. Um, yeah, so the next thing you have to do is decide what you're going to carve on it, and then you start to carve. So I'm going to turn it around and you can see this is what we carved on our pumpkin. We have two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. Do you see on our, my pumpkin? I always like to put a big smile on my pumpkin just to make it look happy for when people come to see it. So after we have all that done, what's the next thing we usually do? Put a yeah, you carve it all out, and that would, what do you do after that? Put a candle in it? Yeah, we put a candle inside. So I have my candle to put in here. And then the last thing that we're going to do, or close to the last thing that we're going to do, is that we're going to light the candle. Light the candle, yeah. So then what we do with our jack o' lanterns is that we put them somewhere where people are able to see them. So some people put them in their windows, some people put them on their doorsteps. And the light from the inside of the candle shines through and comes out the front of the jack-o'-lantern to light the way for everyone to be able to see your nice jack-o'-lantern. Well, boys and girls, I want to share with you that carving a jack-o'-lantern is a little bit about, a little bit like what happens when we let Jesus come into our hearts and we accept him. Because the first thing Jesus does when he comes into our hearts and we're saved is that he washes away all the sin that's in our lives. And then the next thing that Jesus does is he helps to remove all those seeds of doubt, of worry, of fear, of selfishness from our lives. So he takes all that kind of yucky stuff, those yucky thoughts and feelings from us and makes us clean on the inside. And then he puts a big smile on our face so because we're, we're so blessed to have Jesus want to have a, have him in our hearts. And then the next thing that happens is that Jesus' light starts to shine within us to others. So this year, boys and girls, when we think of a jack-o'-lantern, I want you to think about it as well as like Jesus' light shining through. And there's a scripture that is from Matthew 5, 16 that says, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So let's say a little prayer before we leave. So dear Lord and Heavenly Father, I just thank you uh, for blessing us with all these children here this morning. I pray for them, Lord, for their safety as they dress up and trick-or-treat tonight. I pray for them to have fun. I pray, Lord, um, that all of us, as we see all the lights and the jack-o'-lanterns lit, will remember that your light shines inside of us, Lord, because you have saved us. And you are our God in your holy name. Amen. Thank you, kids, and thank you, special guests, for helping us out this morning. Thankful for, thankful for those who have volunteered their time to invest in our children. It's such a crucial part of, uh, of a church community. I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles this morning um, to Joshua chapter 7. And we're going to launch right into it because we're going to look at the entire chapter of Joshua chapter 7. I'm going to read the entire chapter. Uh, so we have 26 verses to get through. And so I want to begin, I want to read God's Word and really uh, take time for us to hear the Word of the Lord. This is actually probably the most crucial moment of our time in worship together, is to hear the Word of God. Um, and so let me read for you. I will be reading from the Christian Standard Bible, um, and it will be on the screen behind me. But if you are reading from your own translations, that is fine as well. Let me read for you. Joshua chapter 7, verse 1. But I'm actually going to begin one verse before. The very last verse of Joshua chapter 6, verse 27, and then following into chapter 7. It says this, 
And the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame spread throughout the land. The Israelites, however, were unfaithful regarding the things set apart for destruction. Achan, son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of what was set apart. And the Lord's anger burned against the Israelites. Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth-Avon, east of Bethel, and told them, Go up and scout the land. So the men went up and scouted Ai. After returning to Joshua, they reported to him, Don't send all the people, but send about 2,000 or 3,000. And in, depending on your translations, it might say, Send two units or three units of men to attack Ai. Since the people of Ai are so few, don't wear out all our people there. So about 3,000 or three units of men went up there, and they fled from the men of Ai. The men of Ai struck down about 36 of them and chased them from outside the city gate to the quarries, striking them down on the descent. As a result, the people lost heart. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord until evening, as did the elders of Israel. They all put dust on their heads. O oh, Lord God, Joshua said, why did you ever bring these people across the Jordan to hand us over to the Amorites for our destruction? If only we had been content to remain on the other side of the Jordan. What can I say, Lord, now that Israel has turned its back and run from its enemies? When the Canaanites and all who live in the land hear about this, they will surround us and wipe out your name from the earth. Then what will you do about your great name? The Lord then said to Joshua, Stand up! Why have you fallen face down? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant that I appointed for them. They have taken some of what was set apart. They have stolen, deceived, and put those things with their own belongings. This is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They will turn their backs and run from their enemies because they have been set apart for destruction. I will no longer be with you unless you remove from among you what is set apart. Go and consecrate the people. Tell them to consecrate themselves. For tomorrow, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, there are things that are set apart among you, Israel. You will not be able to stand against your enemies until you remove what is set apart. In the morning, present yourselves tribe by tribe. The tribe the Lord selects is to come forward clan by clan. The clan the Lord selects is to come forward family by family. The family the Lord selects is to come forward man by man. The one who is caught with the things set apart must be burned, along with everything he has, because he has violated the Lord's covenant and committed an outrage in Israel. Joshua got up early the next morning. He had the Israel come forward tribe by tribe, and the tribe of Judah was selected. He had the cl clans of Judah come forward, and the Zerai cl clan was selected. He had the Zerai clan come forward and by the heads of families, and Zabdi was selected. He then had Zabdi's family come forward man by man, and Achan, son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was selected. So Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and make a confession to him. I urge you, tell me what you have done. Don't hide anything from me. Achan replied to Joshua, It is true. I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I did. When I saw among the spoils a beautiful cloak from Babylon, five pounds of silver, a bar of gold weighing a pound and a quarter, I coveted them and took them. You can see for yourself. They're concealed, concealed in the ground inside my tent with the silver under the cloak. So Joshua sent messengers who ran to the tent, and there was the cloak concealed in his tent with the silver underneath. They took the things from inside the tent 
brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites and spread them out in the Lord's presence. Then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, son of Zerah, the silver, the cloak, and the bar of gold, his sons and daughters, his ox, donkey, sheep, and his tent, and all that he had, and brought them up to the valley of Achor. Joshua said, Why have you brought us trouble? Today the Lord will bring you trouble. So, they all, so all Israel stoned them to death. They burned their bodies, threw stones on them, and raised over them a large pile of rocks that remains still today. Then the Lord turned from his burning anger. Therefore, that place is called the Valley of Achor still today. This is God's word. It's a sober reminder Sober reminder of the consequences of sin in light of God's perfect holiness. Let's pray this morning and we will continue from there. Our Heavenly Father, once again we come before you and we ask, O Lord, that as we have just read your word, we shudder and we tremble. For we know, O Lord, That our sin condemns us in your holiness, in your holy presence. That, Lord, we are not fit to stand before you. And, Father, as we have just read, we see the terrible tragedy, the consequences of what has happened to Israel, what has happened to Achan because of sin. And, Father, we cry out to you today. Forgive our sin. Lead us in the way that is everlasting. As we consider these words for us this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, things can change in a moment. Things can change in a mere moment. Many of you may have heard that um, I spent uh, 10 years of my life in Saskatchewan, out west, in western Canada. I, was, I took Bible college out in Saskatchewan and was a youth pastor at a Baptist church in Regina. And it's hard to live in Saskatchewan without being a Saskatchewan Rough Riders fan. Even if you're not very knowledgeable about football, it's, it's part of life there. And so for myself, not being very knowledgeable of football, found that when the Rough Riders were doing well, you watched. Didn't matter if you didn't understand what was going on. But I remember a particular year. It was 2009. It was the 97th Grey Cup Championship of the Canadian Football League, the CFL. And it was a close game between the Montreal Alouettes and the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. And there was this moment at the very end of the game where they had to make a kick to try and get a field goal. And the Montreal Alouettes, rather, had to make a kick to get a field goal to win the game. And they missed. But before they could call it a miss, the whistle blew because one of the Rough Rider uh, players had ended up on the field and there were too many men on the field and they called a penalty, canceled the kick and allowed for the Alouettes to take another try. In celebrating too early, the Rough Riders had thought they had won, rushed onto the field only to be called off to give the Alouettes another attempt at which they succeeded and won the Grey Cup. Oh, how things can change in a moment that we can be safe, in this case, until one person steps onto the field against the rules and the whole team loses. That was a somber, sober day for people in Saskatchewan. I think everybody went on like a vow of silence following that game. I have friends who didn't even want to talk about it. 
They were feeling the weight of that moment. It's similar to what we have just read in the book of Joshua, where last week we we saw this incredible, miraculous victory at Jericho. I mean, the, the, the people of Israel, the children of Israel, didn't have to send a single arrow, lift a single sword. God caused the walls to fall, and Israel could simply walk through Jericho and conquer it. And here, things change in an instant. What was victory at Jericho now becomes failure at Ai. And what we're going to see today is that God's holiness is incompatible with sin. God's holiness is incompatible with sin. There is a violent, aggressive chaos between God and between sin because of who God is. And so, jumping into the passage, we read, first of all, of a defeat. It actually begins where I began uh, this morning in reading chapter 6, verse 27, that says, The Lord was with Joshua, and his fame spread throughout the land. And then it carries over into chapter 7. The Israelites, however, the Israelites, however, were unfaithful regarding the things set apart for destruction. Something did not translate over from Joshua, who was committed to doing the Lord's will by the Lord's word, as we read back in Joshua chapter 1, that he's to meditate upon the word of God and to obey it and to lead the people in it. Something was not translating to the Israelites. The conquest in which they were to take the land... They crossed over into the land in the first five chapters, and now they're in the conquest of the land to take the land, this promised land. And as we looked at last week, we see that there's something unique about this conquest. We're not, as Christians, called to go and conquer nations, conquer cities. This is completely different. This has to do with God's covenant, God's promise to Israel, and it also has to do with judgment upon Canaan because they are a wicked, idolatrous, violent, sinful people. And so the conquest was not for Israel's personal gain. Rather, it was about God's holiness. And that is why we read last week in chapter 6 that the Lord said that anything that is plundered or taken from Jericho is to be set apart for destruction, is to be removed from the people. They are not to gather whatever they can and take it and keep it for themselves. Rather, it is to be set apart. It is cursed, essentially. It is cursed. These things are set apart for destruction, we read in chapter 6, verse 18. And here in chapter 7, verse 1, we read of Achan, and we get a full long list of his connections, his father and his grandfather and his great-grandfather, and even the tribe. Remember, Judah was a favored tribe in Israel. And and Achan, from this tribe, and from this long list of men of this important tribe in Israel, he Achan has connections. He's he's obviously known, and, and the writer of Joshua wants us to be specifically aware of who it is he's talking about here. Achan is connected. And in the same way, his sin is also connected. His sin is connected to Israel in that his sin is is brought against the account of all Israel and is revealed as being their unfaithfulness, not just one, but all unfaithfulness. You might say, well, how, how is that fair? How is it that it's fair... That, that, that one person's sin can corrupt a whole nation before God. But friends, may I remind us of what is 
said in Romans chapter 5, I believe it's verse uh, 12, that talks about by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, therefore all have sinned. That one man being Adam, all of our father, who through his sin, through his disobedience of God, has corrupted all. Sin has now proceeded into and corrupted all human beings. And therefore we stand condemned because of our sin. And in the same way, Achan has been, is a part of a people of God who have been set apart. Set apart for holiness. And so they are not to take of the things set apart for destruction because they've been set apart for holiness. And elsewhere, as we read in Scripture, all it takes is a little leaven to work its way through the entire lump. Right? Just a little bit of sin. All it takes to corrupt an entire body. This is, helps us to see the, the exceeding sinfulness of sin. The, the, how a little bit of sin is not a little bit, but can become a big problem. An anonymous quote to share with you, the sin that nobody deals with is the sin that everybody deals with. I mean, we don't have to go far to see this. Look at what has happened even in our, in our evangelical circles in the past number of years. The amount of leaders who have fallen because of sinfulness and how that has tarnished the ministry that they've had in God's name. All it takes is a little bit of sin to become a big problem. And so Achan's sin inevitably, get this, inevitably leads to God. At the end of verse 1, we read that Achan, son of Carmi, took some of the, the, what is set apart and the Lord's anger burned against the Israelites. Sin inevitably leads to God. And you, in our sin, we will encounter God's holiness. Sin, it's interesting, in our sin, we think it's a way of us getting away from God, avoiding God, hiding from God, but it all ends back in front of God. Sin will lead us away from God in relationship, but ultimately towards God in judgment. And then we read in verses 2 to 5 of this account of Israel's defeat at the hands of the people of Ai. Notice that it's the result, not the cause, of Israel's sin. This is the result. Achan's sin brings upon Israel this result, this judgment. And I want to just help us to see something here. Jericho was this mighty, fortified city, as we read about last week. Ai is a small country town. A small country town. And Joshua sends spies up to scout it out, and the spies come back and say, hey, there's not much to Ai. Just send two or three units. Now, the word, as I mentioned there when I was reading, it says two or three thousand in some of your, um, some of your translations. Another way of translating that word thousand can also mean units. And it could mean that units were anywhere from 12 to 20 to 30, maybe even to 100 people. We have an unspecified number when it comes to units, so it, it could be that the amount of people that were sent up was not two or three thousand, but rather two or three units sent up, which when you think about how many people died in the conquest of Ai, the 36 men, it, more, it could, could be that the entire unit perished. If there were 12 people, you do the math, and we got 36. It could be that all of them died at the hands of the people of Ai. Regardless of whether it was two or three thousand or whether it was a small number of Israelites and all of them died, either way shows that this was a great loss for Israel, especially when they went up against Jericho and didn't have to raise a finger to conquer them. Here there's loss. Here there is death. Israel is defeated by Ai, and they lose heart. They lose heart. Haven't we read that somewhere else in the book of Joshua? 
twice before. The people of Canaan. We read in chapter 2, verse 11, and chapter 5, verse 1, we read that the people of Jericho and the people of Canaan lost heart. It's as if their hearts melted, flowed like water. And it's here we read the exact same thing happening to the Israelites. Israelites, they lose heart. They are similar to these foreign Canaanite kings. And this is what sin does to us. Sin identifies us with the world. So Joshua falls on his face before the Lord, simply confused and unaware of what's going on, asking the Lord, praying to the Lord, what happened? God, it seems like we're no different than anybody else. You've called us to be your holy people, to be set apart, to be different. Why is it that this has happened to us? But I want us to just pause there and reflect upon this, what these first nine verses teach us about sin. First of all, sin promises good. Sin promises good. For Achan, he thought, he looked and he saw it has good. Sin promises good. It's much like Eve in the garden, right? I looked and saw what was forbidden and saw that it, it was good to the taste and that it would, be, it would be useful to me. Sin promises good. Sin belittles God. It belittles God. It says, God won't mind if you do this. God can't possibly be, take account of everything that's going on in your life. He's, he's far too busy with everything else. And in so we make God like us. We make Him limited. Sin also blinds us as we re read with uh, Joshua in his prayer. It blinds us. We're uncertain. We're un it's unknown. Sin identifies us with condemned world. But we must know this. Sin, as we've seen, even just in these first few verses, sin cannot overcome God's holiness. Sin cannot overcome God's holiness. It cannot go unattended uh, or unpunished. Sin tries to, to prove itself over God, and it is incapable of doing so. Stephen Lawson has said this, Sin is the antithesis of God's glory, a contradiction of His holy nature. It is all that falls short of God's blameless character, amounting to nothing less than cosmic treason against the Creator. And so here, Israel suffers a defeat. Secondly, Israel has a discovery. We see this in verses 10 to 18. God speaks or replies graciously to Joshua. I mean, it's grace that God replies at all. That God even speaks to Joshua in this case. And he says this, stand up. Stand up. He interrupts Joshua's prayer. How often do we see God doing that? Right? Most of us would think, hey, it's good for us to be in prayer. To be in, could you imagine God interrupting our prayer meeting? That would seem unlike God, but, but when we compare it with Scripture, it actually seems very much a part of who God is. What good is piety without a changed heart? We see this elsewhere in Scripture, in Isaiah 1.15 and 1 Samuel 15.22. 1 Samuel 15, 22. I don't, God is essentially saying, I don't want to hear your prayers if they don't come from a changed heart. I hate all of the show. The sacrifices, the, 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 all of the processions and the rituals and the ceremonies, and you haven't changed your heart. What good is your obedience without a changed heart? David says in Psalm 51, verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a contrite heart. A lowly and contrite heart and a broken spirit, O God, you will not despise. And so God graciously reveals to Joshua, he gets to the point, he doesn't leave them to figure it out on their own, to just be wandering in the dark as to what went wrong. God reveals, and he says this, Israel has sinned. Israel has sinned. Now, again, another question comes forward. Why didn't God just tell them who did it? Why didn't God just say, Achan did it? It's Achan's fault. Well, I believe that God was helping Israel to see 
and to show that they must not take lightly sin or God in their midst. They must not take lightly the fact that God has promised to go with them, to be in their presence, to, be, to use His power in and through them. He's promised to, and committed Himself to them. And they must not take lightly that fact that God is holy and in their midst. The tabernacle shows that perfectly. And also they must realize they must not take lightly sin in their midst. Israel, as the Lord says in verses 11 and 15, Israel broke the covenant broke the covenant. What is the covenant? That they will be His people and He will be their God. He will be their God. And so God uses this opportunity to reveal, first of all, His mercy and patience so that they might enter back into right relationship with Him. And also, God uses this opportunity to reveal Achan's resolve to hide. What does God do? He gives them a day. To purify themselves. Consecrate yourselves, the Lord says. And bring yourselves before the Lord. He gives them a 24-hour period for them to purify themselves. And what that means is to reflect upon themselves. Set themselves apart. That means if there's unconfessed sin, they better confess that sin. And what do we hear from Achan? Not a peep. Not a word. God uses this opportunity to reveal His mercy, His patience with the people, to, use, to reveal Achan's resolve to hide, and to, to reveal Israelites need, the Israelites' need for careful reflection and repentance. Purify, consecrate yourselves. Now the question is, did Achan consecrate himself? In, his heart, in himself, in his heart? He might have done outward ceremonies, but in his heart, did he consecrate himself? And likely the answer is no. See, sin, brothers and sisters, is more than merely action. Sin is a corruption of the heart, and it will always lead to further sin. It will always lead to further sin. In this way, Achan's taking of what was set apart for destruction caused him to hide himself further, to lie, to, to put himself in the dark and let Israel be wandering around confused about what's going on. Sin leads to further sin and further disobedience. But God's holiness, praise God, God's holiness reveals. We see this in the next day in verses 16 to 18, that Joshua, God's holiness reveals, searches the people of Israel, and we get this, you know, uh, a finger-biting moment of just what is, what is happening, uh, you know, that it just goes down from, from, from uh, tribe to family to, to, to person, about who did this thing. And it's likely that the Israelites used what was called the Urim and the Thummim, the seeing stones of Israel. It was, the, it was uh, uh, two stones that were set in uh, the breastplate of the priest, and it was a way of determining God's will. It was a way that God offered in the Old Covenant of them discerning God's will on certain subjects. And so they would use the, the Urim and the Thummim, either by sticking their hand in the breastplate and pulling out one, and one would be a yes, one would be a no. And this was God's way of leading them. It was a holy way. We're not talking about some magic crystal ball here. This is the way God Himself has instituted, has ordained to be used. And so, the, using the Urim and the Thummim, or in some means that God has provided, we're not told exactly, Achan is revealed to be the perpetrator. Achan, all these, this searching points to Achan. Friends, I want us to see very importantly, that sin cannot avoid God's holiness, God's sight. Sin cannot, we can try and dress it up, we can try and, 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 and make it look different, 
We can try and hide it. We can try and deny it. But sin, in God's eyes, is still sin. Listen to what John Gerstner, the apologist John Gerstner says. He says, sin is still here. It is just that some is just that people who do not willingly acknowledge that fact. A spade is no longer called a spade, but some euphemism. Little boy, a little boy says to his mother, Why is it that whenever I do anything bad, it's because I'm a bad boy? But whenever you do anything bad, it's because you're nervous. <laughs> it's nerves rather than sin. It's our glands rather than sin. It's what we eat. It's the environment. It's our biorhythm rather than sin. It is anything but sin. Sin denies that it is sin. It's a sober reminder for us. The weight of sin. And it's obvious today, even in our world. I mean, look around today at the ways that we try and deny sin as being sin. The ways that we try and ignore sin. What God has said, you must not do this. You must not be like this. And yet we find all sorts of ways to ignore, to dress it up, to hide it. The Lord says in Numbers 32, 23, be sure that your sin will catch up with you. And that's what happens here with Achan. And we see here a death and a discipline in verses 16 to 26. Joshua says to Achan, My son, notice his approach. My son, give glory to God. The God of Israel. And make a confession to him. I urge you, didn't tell me what you've done. Don't hide anything from me. Joshua is essentially saying, what you have taken from God, His glory, return it to Him. What you have taken, you have taken glory from God that is due to Him and Him alone, and you must return it to Him. Return it to Him. And Achan, knowing there's nowhere else he can go, nothing else he can do, confesses, I have sinned against the Lord. You'll notice the threefold words that he uses to explain. I saw, I coveted, and I took. Through seeing, his covetousness in his heart leads then to his actions. I saw, I coveted, I took. This is multiple breaches. Offending God's name being the most important one. Stealing, lying, coveting. You see, Achan's sin reveals deep unbelief. I know God said that we are to keep ourselves apart from those things set apart for destruction, but he didn't really mean that. And nobody will ever find out. And I can get away with this, and it's just a little bit, right? And in so doing, we do not believe God to be who He says He is, who He's revealed Himself to be. And it's, it shows ultimate idolatry where we remove God, we deny who He is and remove Him and replace Him with something else that we think will fulfill better than Him. This is the essence of all sin. It flows from an idolatrous heart. John Calvin, the great reformer, says, all of our hearts are like idol factories. We're constantly making idols out of things, thinking that those things can saving, save us, thinking that those things can, th- can give us what it is we are so desperately longing for. And so we will pull God aside, we will remove Him in order to exalt those things. It proves unbelief, it proves idolatry, and it is an attack and an affront on God's holy nature. Amazingly, in verse 22, in spite of the confession, Joshua seeks to confirm this account and not make judgment rashly or without evidence. He sends the men to go discover what has been taken. And it's interesting, we often ask, why is it that Achan had to suffer so such a grave punishment in being stoned and then burned and everything that he had? 
It's though that though the Old Testament sacrifices provided atonement, this was an intentional sin against the Lord. We read about unintentional and intentional sins in in Numbers uh, 15 verses 27 to 31, and there it says that intentional sins against the Lord, the the person who does so must be cut off. Why? Because they are a holy nation set apart to do God's work in the conquest of the promised land. And there we read, very sadly, that Achan and everything he had, notice, Achan wasn't poor. He had had oxes, he had sheep, he had belongings, he had family. So this was not a sin of poverty in that I'm poor, I need something, so this is a way for me to to get, to provide for my family. No, Achan wasn't poor, he was greedy and unbelieving. He was greedy and unbelieving. And even his own sons and daughters suffer the consequences of Achan's sin. Because God would not only take Achan's life, he would take his name back. He would take his own name from him his own future from him. Friends, this is so hard for us to comprehend. But we must understand this. God's holiness demands judgment of sin. It demands judgment of sin. In Achan's destruction, he becomes like the Canaanites that God had sent the people of Israel to destroy. He's essentially put himself in the way of God's judgment upon the Canaanite people. And he cannot stand against that. He's not, he's not holy to stand against God's word and God's way and God's covenant and God's promise and God's holiness. He's not, he's not able to stand up under that. Just as Jericho, we read in chapter 6, verses 20 and 24, just as Jericho put themselves in the way of God's judgment, Achan put himself in the way of God's judgment, and stones, a wall, falls on him. And fire falls on him and everything he owns. And thus, the valley there is called the Valley of Achor, which is a word play on Achan's name, which means trouble. The valley of trouble. And it's meant to be a reminder of sin's consequences. That sin cannot exist. Sin cannot exist in in God's holiness or God's presence. Uh, The Puritan theologian John Owen says this very poignantly. Be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Be killing sin, or sin will be killing you. And so, we've just read in these past two chapters, last week and today, we've read about victory to defeat. And we must not ignore this fact. Sin, brothers and sisters, will always end in defeat. Sin will always end in defeat. This violent, disturbing chapter is meant to shake us and to wake us up to the reality, first of all, of God's holiness, and then secondly, our sin. Our sin. God's holiness is incompatible with sin. There's, it's no small matter. It, there's no compromise between the two. Holiness will discover, defeat, and destroy sin. That means you and me. Because as Scripture reveals, we are sinners. It identifies us as sinful people. Not just people who make mistakes or occasionally sin, but we are sinners. We are identified as sinners under God's wrath and God's judgment. But brothers and sisters, this is not without hope. This passage is heavy. These words that I've been sharing are are heavy upon us, but they are not without hope. They are not without good news because it is in the book of Hosea, chapter 2, verse 4, that we encounter the valley of Achor again. In Hosea, chapter 2, verse 4, it says, God will make the valley of Achor a doorway of hope. 
a doorway of hope. And in Isaiah chapter 65, verse 10, God speaks of the valley of Achor, that is the very same valley of trouble, as a resting place for those who seek God's face. How is that possible? How can God take something so brutally destructive and so messed up that we've just read about in in Joshua chapter 7 and make it a doorway of hope, a resting place? Well, the answer is this. Achan could not overcome God's judgment. Achan Achan could not stand in God's judgment. But there stands another. There stands another from the tribe of Judah. That same tribe that Achan was from. There stands another from Judah's tribe who obeyed perfectly. Who is the living example of God's holiness and justice and grace and mercy and truth. And this one, this perfect spotless lamb of God was brought outside of the camp. And he was crucified for our sins. He was crucified for our sins. And there, on the cross at Calvary, the holiness of God dealt full on with the wretchedness of sin. Jonathan Edwards says this, Never did God so manifest His hatred of sin as in the death and suffering of His only begotten Son. Hereby He showed Himself unappeasable to sin. He did not ignore it. He did not overlook it. He carried through his judgment by pouring it out on his son. Thereby, he showed himself unappeasable to sin and that it was impossible for him to be at peace with sin. And yet, brothers and sisters, Scripture tells us God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. And being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came through Christ Jesus, we now have been justified through faith and we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, this morning, may you tremble at the holiness of God and at the magnitude of your sin before a holy God. But friends, may you stand in awe and may you glory not in who you are, but in who Christ Jesus is. And may you stand in awe of the grace that is for you in Christ Jesus because He took our place. He took the punishment of our sin. He stood in the way of God's judgment for us that we might have peace with God, that our sin might be removed from us as far as the east is from the west, and that all who live by faith in the Son of God are no longer sinners by identification, but are children of God. In this you have redemption. In this you have life. In this God's wrath and anger is turned aside from you. That you may stand holy, blameless before a holy God. Let us pray this morning. Father, our prayer this morning is that none of these things would escape us. That, Father, we would recognize that our sin has separated us from our God. That we are deserving of judgment. We are deserving of your wrath. Not just of a physical death as Achan encountered, but a spiritual death. Spiritual death that is complete eternal separation from you. We deserve hell. And yet by your mercy and your grace, O God, because of what you have done for us, Father, we know that this story in Joshua 7 is not the end. That there is a doorway of hope. And that doorway of hope is Jesus Christ. So that all who put their trust in Him may live unto God as His holy, beloved children. 
Father, convict us of sin this morning. Remind us of your holiness and your greatness. And Father, may we glory in our Redeemer. May we always be near the cross, near the cross. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand with me as we close our time together? We're going to sing um, the hymn, Near the Cross. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain, free to all a healing stream, flows from Calvary's mountain. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river near the cross a trembling soul love and mercy found me there the bright and morning star shed its beams around me in the cross in the cross be my glory ever till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the the cross, O Lamb of God, bring its scenes before me, help me walk from day to day with its shadow o'er me. In the cross, in the cross, be I watch and wait, hoping, trusting ever, till I reach the golden strand, just beyond the river, in the cross, in the cross, be my goal. soul shall find rest beyond the river as you go this morning may you remember this truth this hope that we have for those of us who stand condemned by sin we live now by faith in the son of God who loves us and gave himself for us. Paul writes in Galatians chapter 2, verses 20 and 21, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. 
Brothers and sisters, let us make the utmost worth of what Christ has done for us today and live in the glory that we have in Christ Jesus. May you go with God today. Thank you. You are dismissed. Take care.